Hello and welcome to our workshop P3095 Everything Personalization for Any Control at the UI5Con 2022 in the hybrid format. Um, today we are going to talk uh, about, um, about the general information about the topic. Um, we want to present to you how the workshop format is going to be. And next step is we're going to go into the workshop. Um, you're going to do that as an unattended tutorial. And in the end, if I hope we still have a bit of time, uh, we can do a bit Q&A and feedback round. So short introduction of, of ourselves. So I'm Benedict Church. I'm the product owner for the Smart Controls team in Waldorf. And with me today here is Martin. He's a developer in the... Uh, in the smart controls team and mainly driven the implementation of the software we show today. What is the topic today about it? We actually want to tell you how you can implement easily uh, user settings for controls that uh, are usually like stuff like filtering, sorting, grouping, etc. And um, yeah, this is similar to what we do in our own smart controls. I'm not sure if, if you know of them. You can see it in the screenshot. There is the table settings dialog and everything you see there. This is what we're talking about. This is what we try to enable today. Um, basic controls don't come with these features. I mean, we, we might know the responsive table and the grid table, or for example, a gun chart. So they, those don't usually have that, but a lot of applications approach us with a requirement of, yeah, we would like to do sorting and filtering. How is that possible? And at the moment they have to do that yeah, themselves. The implementations are custom. This is quite an effort and quite cumbersome, and it's also not necessarily in line with the FURY guidelines. So our offering should give you something um, that um, is in line with the FURY guidelines that reduces a bit this coding complexity and also the maintenance effort on the long term. And yeah, with that, I would hand over to Martin to give you a little introduction of how do we achieve that. Thanks a lot, Benedict. Um, so yeah, I'm... Uh... As Benik mentioned, I'm Martin. I'm also a control developer in the UFR Smart Controls team and also in, uh, involved uh, in the latest releases in developing uh, this new um, engine that you can find in the SAPM namespace, especially in the P13N folder. And the main artifact that we're also going to take a look at today is the engine. Um, so this is a quite new control uh, just released and it's also currently still in an experimental state. So uh, we're also planning to further improve this and uh, increase feature and functionality in the future releases. So this means this is available in OpenUI 5. And also you might uh, have seen the screenshot that Benedict just showed. So it's basically um, the same UX that you might have already seen for the personalization dialogues for the um, or data smart controls. So for example, uh, you might be familiar with it if you have seen the personalization feature of the smart table, for example. So um, in the past, we already um, spent some time in developing and modularizing the UI parts of these personalization features and different um, personalization panels, such as the selection panel, sort panel, and group panel. And over the time, we discovered the need that it also um, makes uh, sense and is also required for users and uh, application developers um, to have some kind of connection to the control to these UI parts as they just take um, over the UI part itself, but don't really connect this state provided by these panels with some kind of persistency. And this is basically where the engine is uh, becoming useful. So the capabilities of the engine are that it's um, easy enablement of application and controls for personalization. So you have the possibility to uh, register on the engine which is some kind of static concept, and you can basically register different kind of controllers. Currently, there are available uh, three different controller types, the selection controller, the sort controller, and the group controller. And as the name indicates, each of them provides a different type of uh, personalization-specific functionality. And uh, the engine will be used as central artifact to register these different kinds of personalization controllers. As you can see on the um, illustration on the right side, each of these different controllers comes with its own UI. Basically, it's uh, quite easy, as we will see in this workshop, to enable your any control instance in your application for personalization and also have the um, standardized user experience that you are familiar with from your smart controls. So in addition to that, the capabilities are also added. This is compatible uh, to the SAP UI5 flexibility. 
So this means in the end, we are also going um, to implement a persistence for our um, <clears throat> control personalization. And in the end, we are also going to include a variant management to store the state uh, from our personalization in the variant management, which is also a quite nice functionality. So as mentioned, um, we have different standard operations, such as the selection, the sorting, and also we're going to use the selection controller throughout this workshop to also enhance our application system filtering. Okay, with that, I think we can uh, talk about the workshop itself today and the format. So as we're in a hybrid event uh, this year, we, we are planning on doing a live coding session today. So we are going to show you each step and going to implement an application together really step by step and uh, guide you through the new files that are there in the SAP MP13N folder and how you can use them and how you can enable your uh, controls for personalization and how you can make use of the flexibility services in the end uh, to store your personalization. So this means uh, whenever you have a, any question, we also have uh, Yannick and Christopher on the line. So in case you have any question, you can just make use of the chat or for our participants on sign, you can just uh, raise the hand and the one which is currently not presenting will try to assist you. Also, in case uh, you're really stuck and uh, you are not uh, really getting forward, you can also uh, join with one of our speakers in the breakout room and they will try to assist you. So in general, um, we are doing this in a slow pace today. So you can consider for yourself if you would like to follow us live and do the coding for yourself. Or we also documented all of this in a GitHub markdown and you can do the complete workshop unattended. And also in the issue stuff, we are going to provide uh, further assistance and guidance also after the UI 5 con in case you want to repeat it for yourself at some different time or want to repeat a specific exercise. Yeah, I think with that, Benedict, we can continue with the workshop. Let's jump to the tutorial. In the tutorial, we would like to um, yeah, show you how you can use the engine Martin was talking of, how to use the capabilities, how to enhance your own application or build a specific custom control um, that can then enhance a usual UI5 control by the personalization capabilities. The uh, components in focus are as said, this is the sub MP13 and engine, and later on the FL variance variant management where we like to store our data. Um, a little disclaimer up front. So at the moment, our engine is still in the status experimental. It's included in UI5 and it's usable, but we are considering to do minor changes to the API as uh, it's not fully rounded off yet. And we would like to get a bit feedback first so that we can really make it a very, very proper API. Um, for the productive usage, we would recommend that you wait for the public release, which we expect to be in one of the next UI5 versions. So you shouldn't have to wait very long for that. I hope this is understandable and uh, doesn't uh, make you enjoy the, the workshop now less. Um, also, we will keep those learning materials we have provided for this workshop and use them later on as, in, as part of our official documentation. Prerequisites, as said, yeah, you should have implemented a UI5 application or control before to be able to uh, follow the complexity and, and the level the workshop is in. You're going to need a Git, Node.js, and a code editor. Um, I'm not going to start now performing the exercises in my own pace, and uh, you can either try to follow me, just watch and uh, enjoy, or try to uh, catch up with the coding, whatever you like. You're going to also publish the recording later on that shouldn't be a problem to uh, continue at any point maybe where you had to stop before here in our exercises this is the application we would like to build and it's nice and fancy i don't talk about it too much now i think let's start and set up the application in the first exercise so here you uh, see actually the uh, the clone the repository you need to clone and I would just ask you to do that. I did that already, so my application is already running. No need for me to do that. It's better and save some network traffic. Change to the according folder, perform an NPM install, and start the application. And what you then should see should look pretty much like this here. The browser tab should be opened automatically. You should be able to see our nice um, mountain filter grid application uh, without any further features. So we just show you some kind of data about high mountains in the world. You know, there's the name, 
there is the range there in their coordinates, their height, the prominence, which is the parent mountain maybe when was the first ascent, and which countries are they actually touching. So there is a lot of data and yeah, as usual, a lot of data is not very good to work with. So we actually want to personalize this a bit during this workshop. So let's go to exercise two and start with the first step, which is to implement a custom table, which, which houses then our P13 and implementation. So what we want to do is we want to create a new file um, in the web app folder, in the folder control. So let me do that for you. We have, um, we have it here. I think I have to enter a new folder, name it control, have uh, a new file in there, call it p13n table.js because it caters the p13n functionality. And copy this code over. So a few words regarding this extension. So we don't want to change the actual table look and feel. So we keep the according renderer. We give it a name, which is which is the namespace for the control, which we will need to um, require this later for the XML view. Here you can see that. And yeah, I think that's pretty much it. Standard UI5. Not need to not need to explain very much about that. Then let's change to the view. And as I said, we want to include the namespace here. So let's switch to our mountains view. Exchange this upper part. And include the table definition as well, so that we actually can see our new table is being used. Shouldn't change much of the application so far, but that's also only the first step. So. I think I can adjust this a little. Perfectly aligned. So with that, we should actually see still the same things as before. So not much change to our application. We're just using a table now that is extended and we can add some behavior. So first thing we want to do next is um, we want to require the engine so that we can start using the engine capabilities. Go to your table file and require the according dependencies. We're going to use the engine, which is the central artifact for the um, application and control development. And um, we are, which we are later on registering the controls that it should manage to. And then we have the selection controller. It's a basic controller that allows to manage state of control aggregations. It detects changes like adding, removing, or reordering aggregations items. It also provides the according UI for that. So that's a standard UI I said before. You don't have to implement that. Um, we're also going to include a metadata helper, which uh, just helps more or less you to uh, provide the metadata in the right format and uh, also in a way that the engine can work with it. Last but not least, the modification handler, which defines the persistency that is used by the engine to store the personalization changes. So whatever you filter, sort for, or group for, it's going to be stored through the modification handler. The standard modification handler has no real persistency, so everything will just work session-based, but uh, that is also something we're going to come to later and uh, include a more powerful modification handler here. So as said, we need to register our P13N table to the engine so that they both know each other. And we're going to do that uh, when the binding is initialized, the first one, so we want to register it. Uh, after the update finished event has passed once because we need access to the tables items aggregation. So let's put this code in here. And now we should be able um, to initialize the table. As said before, we want to provide um, the metadata in a certain format. 
Um, this format uh, requires a key and a label as shown in here. So uh, I also explain it here. Um, the key is used to identify according items and is by default associated with the corresponding control ID. Custom scenarios, this can be overridden, but let's keep it simple for now. And this uh, second part is a label that is going to be displayed in the according dialog. So that also um, is something in, in plain readable text. It can be translatable and will be shown on the dialog as said. What we're looking at here, everything should be personalized, it should be serializable. So as parts of it might be stored in the persistency layer, we cannot just pass any functions because that wouldn't work. So furthermore, we would not recommend to put any personal or protected information in here as it might be stored depending on your modification handler in the local storage or on some server. And for sure, it needs to be ensured that this data is protected properly, just as a remark. Um, we're gonna also add the path here because we're gonna need this later for providing some filter statements, but I think this is uh, this is future. Um, exactly, this is just an example of how the metadata is, is uh, retrieved here. I think for specific application scenarios, this might look completely different. Uh, we're aware of that, this is a pretty simple version, um, but uh, this is just the way how it works. So my, maybe you need to, to get some other data than just uh, reading from a certain JSON or getting some ideas here. Okay, the next step is um, the uh, registration to the engine, which is performed after we you know, generate the metadata provided to the metadata helper. So we add this helper, we also put this helper to the registration. We define the modification handler here. We add a certain controller, in our case, the selection controller and tell which aggregation the selection controller should manage. In that case, that's the columns aggregation. So let's do that. Um, one remark at this point, the columns aggregation of the table is after you perform the registration managed by the engine. Um, that means that there should be no alteration of the columns aggregation via the usual API, like add column, remove com column, as this would lead to conflicts with internal mechanisms of how the engine works and how the changes are actually provided. Um, only that way the engine can act as a central management for state and persistence. It's, it's not like there is no option to do that. We're gonna show it later, but you just should not use the normal API as this would lead to conflicts. Um, as we want to, as we said, we're gonna also provide the UI. We need to implement a, a little function to open it actually. So what do we need for that is a little button and an event handler that is gonna be registered to the according button event. So let's add this method to show the dialogue to the P39N table as well. So as far as I see, we should be able to see a button now. Am I actually on the right? I, I didn't enter the button yet. Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, I think I should add the button to the XML view before expecting it to be there. That's totally right. Um, it's nice that we have an event handler, but for sure we also need to define it in the view. Okay, let's go to our XML view and there we have a nice aggregation called actions in the dynamic page where we can add the button and now we should also be able to see it or we don't see it. Oh, give me one moment. Ah, here we go. Excuse me, I was in the wrong folder. So now we can also finally see our button which doesn't do very much at the moment. The next step is uh, control the function which is going to get. I think, I think that was right. Sorry, I got a bit confused here over all the looking for the button. So we for sure need to add the button handler also to our controller to see that this is working. Finally, be able to call the um, the method of our P30N table to open the according dialog. Here we go. Start sweating already. Um, 
Okay, as far as we, we see, we have all of our columns available. We can try to reorder them. We can click a bit around, but nothing will happen yeah, at the moment. We didn't implement any behavior here. So we have the dialogue and this is what we're going to do in the next exercise, which is about the column selection controller and popover. So what we did before was just adding the metadata registering to the engine, but we didn't really um, provide any behavior. This is done by attaching to the state change event of the engine. State change of the event of the engine is always fired when anything um, this, that is registered to the engine changes its state, as said. So um, we're going to just do it. I think we let's um, take this snippet and add it to our table in the initialization method so that we can see that something's happening as soon as we change the state. For now, I will add a little snippet to print it in the console, and then we have a look at it. So, and as soon as I did that, we can now, we can now change something in the dialog. And then we should be able to see that something is going to be printed in the console. So here we go. We have a, a return of our columns controller that gives us the state that we're actually in. So first step is I think we we changed. I, I did a few changes, so that's why you see a few events here. Um, you see the original, more or less original state um, with one change I did in the second. I changed some orderings, so the prominence, oh no, I, I hide the prominence, so that's why in the second object you find won't find the prominence anymore. And there was another change in the third object, so yeah, much talking. I think uh, what is what is important to remember is in the state change event, you always get the current state of the object, like a full state and you can work with it later on but that's part of the next exercise maybe just to add this as we're currently seeing this object so you can also see here the state object is basically always reflecting the current registry state of your controller so you can see for example the root tag of this object is currently columns which is also this arbitrary key that we registered in the initial process uh, for our selection controller. So we can basically see this array provided with these objects here is basically reflecting the current state with all these unique keys in their order. And also uh, once we deselect something, this entry will no longer appear in this array. So and this is now what we can utilize to uh, actually change the state of our table. As we now got what the table state object does and how it is properly structured, let's implement some behavior which uh, which comes when we actually change the state. So therefore we have to um, enhance our state change method a little. And what we wanna do now is implement the setting of visibility and moving of columns. So let's replace our print line snippet at one so lock um, with something that does a bit more. So in that part, we're gonna set the visibility and also implement some moving for the columns. This looks a bit cumbersome. One might think it is more or less a one liner, but uh, we not only have to move uh, the column itself because that would only move the header. We also have to transport the content. So this is why this looks a bit cumbersome here. And as well as we have to move the template so that also the binding gets actually placed in the new position. Um, in case you wonder why this is a bit of a long snippet here. Yeah, this is how the table works. Um, the takeaway here is it might be totally dependent on the control you want to enhance how this coding looks like. So in case you're using a chart, might be a completely different thing. Um, how you would perform a move or in case you have some other like I think the Gantt chart has also nice tables there. In, in case those tables work differently, then you can just implement the handling here differently. That is totally up to you. Um, yeah, saving this. I think um, we can have a look at it now if that works on the application. And if I didn't do anything wrong, that should be the case. So let me first move, remove here some features like countries and coordinates. And you see, they're actually gone.
And then let's also perform a reordering. For example, I like to see the first S and a bit more prominent before the prominence actually. Also, that would work. Okay, great. I think, um, yeah, that was it about this exercise. It's the first step in the state handling. And in the next step, we're going to see uh, what else we can do with the state and what kind of personalization features are supported by our engine. So as said before, sorting and grouping capabilities are also major parts of personalization in our smart controls. And for sure, we wanted to give something um, to your hands that makes it also conveniently possible to do that. Um, for this, we're going to have to require new controllers, which are going to provide the management and also the UI. Um, and these are the sort and group controller. So let's add them to our dependency list. So also the sort and group controller offer specific UIs by the engine show method. Um, in addition to that, the state also gets enhanced to what we saw before, where there was a, only a columns entry in the state, there will now also be a, an, an entry for the sorter and the groups. And exactly like Martin mentioned, those entries um, are in the state with the names that you registered the controllers here. So let me also add this. So, okay, at the moment we won't see much more, <laughs> just to show you that there is nothing happened yet. Um, we also need to add those to the um, open P13 and callback and tell the engine actually to also show these two panels. So let's do it. Just gonna replace the whole method here and then we're going to see next time I open it. We also have a nice sort and group panel. Um, <coughs> we'll be going a bit back to the to the actual behavior. Uh, not there yet. So I think if I enter now a sort criterion, because we see our properties are here, but I cannot just sort it by let's say first s and now because it would be not implemented. So nothing happens here. I'm going to reset everything at the moment and then let's provide the handling for it. So to do that, we're going to have to implement standard sub UI uh, model sorters. And um, we also have to inspect the state object again for those sorters and groups. Um, we do this in the snippet here. So as you see, before we only had a look into the columns and did the moving. And now we can iterate on the sorters and for each we just put a new sorter that gets uh, the according path, the binding path, which we provided via the metadata helper before, and uh, the according setting for the sorter. So in that case, um, that was it for the grouping. We also have to uh, provide the setting for the sorter that is actually a grouper and not a sorter. And then just standard UI5 coding, we apply that to the according binding. Um, so let me provide that. And with that, we can now also, let's say, sort it for the, what would be good? Let's take the prominence and see. Now this is completely differently sorted than before. I think the data is already sorted. That's why I have to take some examples. So we can sort ascending, can sort descending, can also remove the sorter again. So fine, and we can also define a grouping and a nice grouping, for example, by the countries. And then we see everything gets grouped. And that was like this, how many lines of code? I think like 20 more, pretty easy to achieve in my opinion. So this is the convenience the engine is gonna give to you. And um, with that already with a few, uh, let's say in this, in this case, 120 lines of code, 
um, you have a complete implementation for for personalization on this custom control already and as you're going to see later it will not be much more to be able to save those into variants um, now we can yeah also um, go to the next exercise i think um, and this is about changing the control state. As I said before, it's at the moment not allowed to uh, use the add aggregation or remove aggregation API anymore, but this might be still a use case and depends on the application. So the engine has also ways to overcome this. What is the only thing you need to do is use the according engine API so that the machine underneath can work its job. We have two APIs on the engine. Um, one is to retrieve the state, which gives you pretty much the result we saw already in the state change event, the current state of the application. And you also get the apply state, which allows you to provide a state with modifications and can be applied to the target control. Um, those modifications need actually really to be added to the state. So they are more or less in the instruction format, um, but you're going to see that a bit later. So let's add these two methods to our table an apply state and a retrieve state method calling. Sorry, the actual engine method. We do that so that the engine is more or less in the P13N uh, table implementation um, and is not really visible to the application developer who is later on going to use the P13N table. So also here we need to listen or to wait for the p initialized promise because we never know when this update binding finished will come and so that's why we stored that up here we're going to use it here the whole api is asynchronously so those two have promise return values and uh, you have to wait or you have to check the success handlers parameters for the state object next let's add a toggle button to our view so that we are also able to use the api might be a bit an artificial use case, but it's more for demonstration purposes that you see how to do that. If you need to alter something programmatically, this is the way. So add another button here, in this case, a toggle button. And then check our application. You see we have up here a new button, so it doesn't do much. Um, we want to implement that and also add a message toast. Um, let's lose a few words on how to how to work with the state here, maybe. I mean, the message toast and the more interesting thing is this, this toggle handler here we're looking at. So what we want to do is alter the state. That means we, we change the visibility setting um, of the, the range column. So this will be either shown or hidden depending on what we currently pressed on the button but we also want to give it a certain position so in that case we add position zero this is how we move around stuff via the api you need to give it the position where it should be uh, it doesn't just you know line in when you change the position in the state object itself this is just not how the engine works we need to have the index and then, then we can put it in the right place so let's add the message toast as dependency in the mountains controller. And also add the on toggle range callback. And furthermore, we also need to memorize the ID of the range column so that we're able to find it said this is a bit artificial for sure but it's just for learning purposes so now we should actually be able to toggle the range with the uh, grid and uh, within the grid so let's do it okay you can see the range is gone and when we add the range it's actually added in the first place so now let me move it again to somewhere else you can set it here it's on the second i add toggle it and i put it to the beginning again so this is how you work with the state um, in the engine. This is a very crucial part to understand that if you do that, you need to add those modifications to the state object. Um, we're going to have a bit uh, more intensive exercise on that later on. Yeah, that's it for me now. I would like to hand over to Martin to continue with the exercise number seven. Okay, thanks a lot, Benedict.
<clears throat> so at this point, maybe I would like uh, to take a moment to actually uh, check with you. Um, are there currently some open questions or something uh, that we would like to uh, dig deeper into for now for the first uh, half? You could now maybe just ask questions in the chat or speak up uh, if you have any kind of question or topics that we should maybe take a look into. Just repeating the question also that the people on the line can hear it. So um, the question was that um, if we can also use different kinds of models or if we can just use a uh, JSON data for the personalization. Um, this is actually a good question. So um, as I mentioned earlier in the initial presentation, we uh, restructured this approach from the smart controls. So basically that we can also independently of any protocol make use of it. This is also why we have this kind of uh, metadata helper interface where you provide some um, protocol agnostic uh, key label structure. So basically just for demo purposes, we're using a JSON model here since it's easy to use and doesn't require any kind of external service, but you could basically consider to use any kind of service such as a data, for example, and provide the property names, for example, as unique key uh, for your uh, engine connection. So that in the registration process, in the end, you will basically, for example, uh, consider to use property names for the registration process in the metadata helper. So, so yes, that would be possible also to use it with different kind of protocols. If there are no further questions, then I think we can actually continue uh, with the second half of the workshop. So maybe just to recap, uh, before we start with the second half, uh, what we learned so far. So basically, uh, so far, we're utilizing um, the personalization engine uh, to register our controls. And we also learned how we can use um, the personalization pop-ups using the engine show method. We also learned um, that the engine is basically providing this model agnostic and serialized state format, which basically each in control could interpret in a different kind of way. This is also the reason why we call this that you could use the engine to personalize any kind of control using these UI and these kind of state uh, retrieval and appliance methods. So um, basically now we are starting with a little more complex part and we are also using some different kind of controls than just a regular table. And uh, basically what we would like to do in our application right now is we would like to start adding a filtering option to our table. So right now what we can do is we can open the personalization dialog, we can add different kinds of personalizations, but it would also be nice to have some kind of uh, filter functionality. And for that, we are also going to use um, the selection controller that we used earlier, but this time we're actually not using it to target the visibility of different kinds of columns, but we're actually using it in a different kind of manner. So first of all, I would therefore like to take a quick look at our filters JSON that was also predefined in our starting point in the application. So here in this um, filters JSON, you can see that we are basically uh, mocking some kind of uh, filter metadata where we define different kinds of labels and descriptions. For example, this first filter here is defining a filter for very high mountains and has a description that the height is defined as greater uh, than eight kilometers. And we also directly have the filter expressions here that basically say we are filtering for the height with a greater <coughs> operator with a greater than for the value 8,000. We also provide some icons and a nice color and we are going to bind a grid list throughout uh, the next step here. So I will just copy this and explain it in a second. So first of all, we are going to the mountains uh, view and here we are going to add in the dynamic page header the grid list control. So this grid list control here is bound to our filters JSON model. And here in this case, you can see um, we already did some layouting with a nice H box, V box, and an icon. And we are binding um, our grid list items to our grid list. So if I'm just going to the application to take a look. So if I'm just going to the application, I can see I have the grid list. And I can see um, that it's looking nice. And the idea is that we are going to use this as some custom filtering in the end for our um, table below. So you can see as of now, we don't have any kind of functionality for that, but we want to change that. So in the next step, we are going to actually also register our grid list to the engine similar as we did to our P13N table. So to do that, um, we are actually in this time 
going to our mountains controller. And again, we are loading the engine required artifacts. So in this case, the engine itself, also the standard modification handler, and also the selection controller. So, and therefore we will also need again to do the registration similar as we did with our P13M table. So in, we got luckily our own init function for the lifecycle handling of our controller. And here we are adding a new init grid filter method. And in this init grid filter method, we are basically going to retrieve the data from our filter model. So also to the question that was just asked, and this is basically the format where you could also consider that you retrieve any kind of data from some different model that doesn't have to be, have to be JSON data. Basically, this is just the interface um, on how um, the engine and AI and will use the data that, for example, if you open a personalization pop-up, that it has the possibility to have some interface to display the data and to, for example, display some label text in the end. So in this registration here, we are also making use of the standard modification handler and our filter helper that we just created here. And in this case, we are doing some things differently than before. Um, since we don't have a table in this case, but we have a standard grid list that does, which doesn't come with a columns aggregation, we are going to set the target aggregation to items since we want to personalize the items aggregation this time. Also, in addition, we want um, not to set the key for our registration to columns. We could do that if you want to, but it, would, it wouldn't make much sense. So it's a convenient uh, convention to just name it maybe to the aggregation name that you can easily um, make use of this in later methods, such as if you want to, for example, show a personalization UI. In addition, we are also going to implement a state change event, similar as we did it before. But uh, before I come to that, I will actually paste this method that I just explained to our mountains controller. And here, um, again, if I now would, um, if I now would, for example, start, um, to implement functionality such as um, changing the selection and so on. I would like to do that whenever the personalization state of my engine changes. So basically similar as we did it with the table here, we are now retrieving a end state event, which basically has the state of currently selected items. And you can see this is basically where, where this becomes handy with the state handling because you don't have to couple this with any kind of control or visibility settings, but you can completely freely interpret this in any way you would like to. So I'm going to add this here. And for now here, we are not doing much in the first step, but only the only thing that we would like to do is whenever we change the selection in our dialog, which we're also going to add in a second, we also would like to update our grid list. So in this case, we are not manipulating the visibility, but in this case, we are updating the selection state of our grid list. So therefore, similar as we did it in our P13N table, I am also going to add an engine show method and going to wrap this in an on grid filter press event handler. And here you can see, um, similar as we did it with the table where we added the different keys for, uh, we want to see the columns uh, tab, we want to see the sort and the group tab. This time here we say, we want to see the items dialog by providing this key that we did provided earlier in our registration. So then we also need to call our on grid filter press method. And we can do that in our XML view. So in this case here, basically similar as before, the only thing that we changed here is adding this grid filter button here. So this grid filter button doesn't do much. It only comes with a nice icon for a grid. And it also calls our on grid filter press method that we just implemented earlier in our mountains controller. Okay. So this is working fine. So I will check and I can see I have a new button in the application. Just move this around a little. And if I open this now, Nothing happened. That's unfortunate. Double check. Okay, another safe and refresh did it did the trick. Um, so I can see now again I have a personalization dialog, but this time it's a little different than before because here you can see nothing is selected although every item is visible. But here, as I mentioned, uh, our selection uh, handling this is a little different. And if I confirm this now, basically 
we implemented in our state handler that we actually would like to update the selection state rather than the visibility, which is also working fine. I could also now do a reset, for example, and all of this works. Okay. In the next step, we would actually like to enhance our state uh, change handling um, to actually start filtering our grid list and to um, actually start filtering our P13N table that we implemented earlier. So to do that, we will take another look at our P13N state change um, event handling. And here you can see currently we are just um, updating the selection and we are not doing much else in this handling here. But so if you take another look, for example, in our P13N table here, in here in our on state change event handling, we basically toggled the visibility of our columns. And also in addition, we toggled the position of our columns whenever they changed. So in this time here, in our mountains controller for the personalization registration of our grid list, we're gonna do something different. We're actually using the selection state of these different kind of boxes to create model filters. So I would just add a small snippet of code here. So you can see this code just added two new variables. Uh, we're going to use this as filter string later in a different exercise. And here we have an A filters array. Basically, what we're doing here is we're looping over this item state, which is provided in our O state object. And the items key here in our all state object is basically the key that we've provided for our grid list personalization registration. And here we are basically looking in the model context of our filters JSON and basically creating new filter objects and pushing them to our A filters array whenever the selection state changes. So we can now use these different filters and actually apply them on our personalization table. So keep in mind, we are currently in the state change event of our grid list, but we are actually using the state change event to create some kind of uh, filter objects and actually apply them on our P13N table that we created in the first half of this workshop earlier. Okay, so another thing that I would like to show, which is also a little different than we did it before, you might have noticed that I copied a selector here for our selection controller. This is also something uh, which we didn't do before. And this is because the selection controller by default is coupled uh, to the visibility handling. But um, as so basically, whenever you open the personalization dialog, the selection controller will check if the item is visible or if it's not. And according to that, the dialog entry will be checked in the uh, list control. So since the selection controller can't possibly know every kind of scenario that you would like to implement, so in this case here, we are uh, checking the uh, selection state of our list. So uh, you have the possibility to override this default with a custom selector callback. And we could now also do a little even more proper handling here. This is optional. You could also stick with the uh, selected behavior, which is totally fine that we just implement, but just to demonstrate how it works. So in this case here, we are basically retrieving um, the filter objects from the items binding of our table to basically really keep in sync what is selected in our dialog and what I filter is actually present in our table. So basically, um, every time uh, the personalization dialog is op opened, the selector is being called for each and every uh, different kind of property visible as item in your selection dialog. Okay, so if I now take another look at the application, I can basically now see that if I, for example, open the personalization dialog, second, refresh it again. Probably. Second, I would just make sure. OK, 
play another track. Okay, I think now I got it. Yeah, I forgot uh, the bind. I didn't copy that one. Okay, sorry for that hiccup. So basically, if I'm now, for example, using the selection uh, here in this dialog, and I'm now, for example, filtering for, let's say, Mount Everest, I can see uh, that this is working fine. I can see the parent mountain is filtered to Mount Everest. We could also see the table shaking and changing its data. I can also make use of the reset functionality, for example, and I can see this is properly done. So this is working quite nice, but I can also see if I now want, for example, filter here directly, I maybe don't want uh, to use this dialog, but I just want to directly click here and filter. I can see nothing is happening yet. And that is because this is currently not coupled with the state handling of the engine. So we will also need um, to change that. And we can do that by actually also using the apply and retrieve state APIs uh, that we explained and learned earlier. So I'm going to use, um, sorry, that's the one. Yeah, the on grid filter select event handler. So in our mountains view, when we added our grid list earlier, we can see we have the selection change event. So basically the selection event is fired whenever the selection state of our grid list changes. So this is the perfect event for us to hook in. And we can now attach us to this on grid filter select event. And then our event handler, we can now make use of the two APIs that also uh, Benedict showed us earlier in um, our P13N table. So we can use the APIs retrieve state and subsequently the apply state API. So basically the retrieve state API will return us the current state and we can see which items are currently um, provided by the selection controller in the same format as we saw it earlier in this array where we would now in the start be an empty array because we don't have any kind of filters available yet. And here, um, whenever uh, we change it, we can either push an entry to this array or we can set it to visible false that we don't want to see it. And basically this is the order which you would probably call these two methods. First, you retrieve the state. In between, you would do your modifications and afterwards you will just call the apply state API. And then basically you are also communicating the state change to the engine and all will be perfectly in sync together with your UI. Okay, so I will try if this is working fine. So if I'm now, for example, filtering here for Mount Everest, I need to save, of course. If I'm now filtering for Mount Everest, I can see it's directly working. And this is thanks to our state change event handling that we implemented earlier here where we create the filters. And now that I'm properly calling this apply state APIs, also whenever we change the selection, this is also a part of the engine processing and the engine will calculate the delta to the states before and after the selection changed. And which is also quite nice now is that all of this is in sync together with the dialogue, which is also provided by the engine. So I could also say, if I don't want to filter for Mount Everest, I rather want to filter for, uh, let's say Nepal. And I also want uh, to filter for uh, high mountains. Okay, all of them are high. Let's say the recent ascent uh, should be greater than 2000. Okay, there's actually none. But if I remove this, for example, I can see there are two. And I can also see that all of this is always in sync with the dialogue, which is actually quite nice. Okay, but actually what we are seeing right now is we somehow use the personalization for our grid list to actually create filters for our table below. So the user might not directly understand currently that this uh, filtering and the selection here is coupled to the table below. So it somehow would be a convenient for the user if there was some kind of uh, indication that the grid list on top is basically used for filtering the table below. We want to change that by actually adding a filter info text whenever our state change um, event is being called. So we're continuing to the next exercise. So in this exercise here, in the first step, we are going to implement the set filter info text method. The set filter info text method um, 
expects some uh, string as argument and basically is doing um, is creating a new overflow toolbar and setting this on the info tool by aggregation of our p13n table. So it's doing also some nice layouting. So we're adding a text uh, with a filtered by text and we are also adding a label. And there we're basically expecting a comma separated list of all the filters available. And there um, we are visualizing this in the overflow toolbar and directly probably uh, setting it uh, in the info toolbar of our table. So I will just add this method. Okay, so usually if you do something like that, the tricky part would now be you actually would need to know whenever the binding state and whenever the filtering of your table changes. But since we are using the engine in this case, we basically have everything present that we need because we have this uh, state change event that we attached here. And we are also using this to keep the selection synchronized between our dialogue and between our grid list. And we are also using it to create this different kind of model filter objects. So we can just add some additional implementation here. By not just creating the filter objects themselves, but we are also using the description coming from the filter model context to actually create these labels and in a comma separated list as some kind of uh, filter expression string. And each time our state changes, we are updating um, our info toolbar and our table by calling the set filter info text method. Okay. I will take a look at that. And I can now see if I, for example, filter for Karakoran, I can see I have this nice filtered by text here. And then again, since all of this is coupled with the state handling of the engine, I can just add different filters and all of these three different parts, the filter info bar, the selection here, and also the dialogue, all of this is in sync together with Jidaja, which with each other, and also working with the functionalities such as the reset and so on. And of course, I think we haven't even come at this yet, Benedict. The dialogue comes with also some handy features. You, for example, have um, these uh, nice uh, reorder functionality that you can also disable for, because for example, here in this case, you might not really need the reordering. So there's just a flag available on the selection controller. So you could also just say you don't want the reordering in this case because you don't need it. But we're going to skip this for now, but just as an information and also the reset and the show selected and so on, all of this is provided out of the box also such as the search, for example. Okay. But I think with that, we can continue to exercise then. So now we added actually a lot of different personalization functionality. We can actually also start doing some customization. Um, as, you, as I just explained, for example, we have the possibility to um, set the reordering, for example, to false or true on your selection controller, depending if you would like to have that. Some different things that you would probably like to do is to actually do some minor changes um, to your personalization UIs, such as for the filtering here, for example, we don't have much content. We also have only seven filters available. So why not make the dialogue a little smaller since the default is expected to show larger amounts of data. So we can just set the content width and content height. We could just say we set this maybe to 25 RAM as the width and 30 RAM to the height. And also in this case, uh, you can provide any kind of uh, custom title and uh, the engine will make sure that all of this is properly visualized with all the buttons available in the dialog. So um, usually also you probably rather, and you should rather use uh, internationalized text rather than hard coded strings. We are just doing this here for demo purposes that you can directly see which string is going to be displayed in the end in the title. So, okay, so in addition, before you actually take a look at that, I'm also going to directly add another functionality. And that is, um, you might have noticed, we already have in this filter selection, the reset functionality, but actually why not add a clear filter functionality for our grid list that the user doesn't even have to open the dialog and press reset and okay, but to rather just uh, directly open, uh, offer a clear filter icon directly in our application so the user can just uh, get rid of all of his filters at once. 
So we will do that by just adding a new button to our application. And this is the clear filter button here. Everything else should stay as it is. Going to add it in the second position. And I've got the opening tag, <laughs> no, not the closing tag. Okay, so also here, um, we have now this clear filter button. We give it a nice clear filter icon from the, the icon library, set it uh, to transparent. And here we are using the on clear filter press uh, event handler. So we will add a new method to our mountains controller here. I will just put this somewhere for now. And here um, you can see in this on clear filter press, we are basically retrieving our grid filter control. And first of all, we are moving all the selections and then we are calling the retrieve state API of the engine. And there we are basically just setting every entry in our grid list state to visible false and basically say we want to get rid of all of the available state. And then we are going to use the apply state API by providing our registered control instance and the state that we just cleared. Okay, so I'm going to save that. And now in my application, I can see I have this nice clear filter I can hear, and I will just do some personalization. I will um, add some filter values, and now I can just press this clear filter. And oh, I can also see the dialogue change, but it didn't really change as I wanted it to be. Uh, I want it actually to be the width 30 and the height 25, I think this way. Um, Okay, nice. So I can see I just had a little typo there. That's why it didn't probably change. And now I can see it is now uh, looking a little smaller. I could also do it any kind of different uh, customization for my dialogue in case I'm not happy with this configuration. Okay, but now we can see we really added a lot of different personalization functionality for our application. We can now um, toggle the pre-13 end table programmatically. We can use the personalization dialog for our table. We can make use of the reset. So we have some custom filtering for our table and the filter info text, all of this tightly coupled with our engine implementation. Now you might, uh, think um, that it actually would also be a very handy if the user is now using this application and he would now, for example, create a, some kind of uh, configuration where his list is filtered that he can only see um, the mountains of a specific country that have uh, ascent later than 1900, for example, he would probably like to have this also available the next day. As we already mentioned, we have currently this modification handler. Um, available, which is just the default implementation in our registration, which is currently not persisting at all. It's just the default configuration for session persistence and for your session personalization. So we want to change that and we actually want to make use uh, of the SAP UI5 flexibility services for that. And also this is uh, integrated uh, in our engine, which kind of gives you the possibility to enable your application for personalization and also for variant management. So we also um, added the official documentation in case you want to learn further about this and also the requirements that you might need uh, to uh, uh, do upfront before you can actually make use of these kinds of services. So first of all, we will need to add a variant management to our application that we can actually um, give the user the possibility to create different kind of views. We can do that by adding two more namespaces to our view. And we're here adding, first of all, the SAP UI FL namespace. And also we are going to add the SAP UI FL variance namespace. And in the variance namespace, we actually can find the variant management control. So I'm just adding this next to our buttons in our actions aggregation of our dynamic page title. And here I can see the API of the variant management. It's basically very easy to use. You just have to provide an ID for it uh, as you should do it in general for all of your static controls um, in your um, XML view. 
um, providing a stable ID is generally also a thing which is especially relevant uh, in case for the persistency that whenever the changes are going to be applied and persisted, that it's always attached to the same control, which is why you should always provide stable IDs for the control that you're going to personalize. But this is also all available in the documentation that you can also find in our workshop here. And in addition, you have the four association. And here in this four association, you actually need to attach all the containers that should be relevant for the persistency. So in this case, we're adding the table, our P13N table that we just created, and our grid filter control that we also enhanced with personalization, implementation, and logics. Okay, so if I now take a look at the application, I can see uh, that we have the variant management and that I even created some variant up front, which I'm just directly going to remove. And uh, I can see that the variant management is working fine. You might already notice, for example, from different kinds of applications in UI5. And here I could now start to create different kinds of views. But for now, we need one more thing, actually, actually two more steps to change in our current implementation. So the first thing is that whenever you're dealing with uh, the flexibility service, um, also since there is a lot of optimization done to cache different kinds of changes, we always need in the XML already to have the registration available for the recording flexibility change handlers. In case you would want to enable a custom control for flexibility, you would probably need to implement your own change handling for the persistency. But in this case, this is all provided by the engine to a central flexibility handler of the engine itself. So every control that you would like to enable for flexibility services, you can just point to the central engine flex file as we did it here. And we're going also to do that to our P13N table in the same fashion. Maybe one mention here. Um, as I said before, the P13N table itself actually should be ready to use for the consumer. So there is an option that you also can uh, define this uh, flexibility file in a library. But as we don't introduce the reuse library during the tutorial, we're just going to do it that way. But um, by having that, actually, you can still have the P13N table as a reuse control without any touch point to our engine or to the flexibility library that would be everything included. So Martin, you can go ahead. Exactly. Uh, I think that's a good point. Um, also here, just for easy demonstration purposes, we have a reusable control here, as Benedict mentioned. Um, this is probably something which you would do to rather custom control specific uh, stuff rather than really reusable controls. So that's a good point to consider when you implement really derivations and reusable controls. Okay, so we now properly added the flexibility change handling reference to our controls that are enabled for personalization. And now actually, in case uh, you would think about adding custom handling to your persistence, you would probably need to do some kind of uh, snapshot of your data and store this somewhere and apply it the next times to your application. But uh, this, all of this is basically taken over by the engine and also one of the main purposes by the engine that you don't have to deal with the persistence layer and you just have a interface that you can just replace. So if I now, for example, go to our mountains controller, I can see here in the init grid filter method that we registered our standard session modification handler. And we're just going to replace this with the flex modification handler, the wording according to the flexibility services. So we will also need to change our dependency, of course, since we're no longer using the modification handler, but we're using the flex modification handler. We're also going to do the same thing uh, to our P13N table, because in the end, we want all of the personalization state to be stored and not just from one control. So also here, we're replacing the modification handler registration, and we will make use of the flex modification handler. And also here, I'm going to replace the dependency. Okay, so and with that, I go to the application, quickly check. Okay, somewhere I did not properly. Uh, oh, sorry. I didn't rename the module. 
Okay. Okay, so now the application is uh, starting again. Okay, so now um, basically all we had to do uh, to actually enable our application for the flexibility services is we of course need the variant management control, which we added to our view. We added the reference to the central change handling of the engine. And we also um, switched the modification handler, which is basically just one line of code. And with that, I will now, for example, deselect some columns. And I can now see that the variant is properly reflected as 30 because we actually changed the state. So now, for example, if you reselect the variant, you can also see that you're switching back to the view and that this is now pro, uh, coupled to the variant management as it should be. We can also really do some, some uh, more personalization. Let's say we do some column reordering, we switch parent mountain, mm, can switch it back again maybe. We can also say that we want to group for, uh, let's say countries. This is also working fine. And also let's say we want to filter for high mountains and also that have an ascent greater than 2000. We can see that it's now a lot easier to use our application with this uh, lots of presentation features that we just implemented and that we can store this in a variant. Let's say yeah, five con demo. Oh, just just this one. Just call it your yeah, five con. And now if I'm also switching the variants, for example, then I can see I'm going back to standard and I can also go back to UI5Con. I can now, for example, reload the application and I can just go back to my persistent view. And um, this is working quite nice. So I can now also make use of these features such as research, for example, which will by default just go back to the state um, how the view um, has been uh, left um, in the last uh, in the last state which was not dirty so in case uh, here for example yeah i could just for example remove some columns go back to standard which would be basically the same as pressing the reset in the dialog so also if i'm triggering now these programmatic changes such as toggling the range for example since we're using this in the central engine registration all of this uh, is working together with the variant management as persistence Okay, so, and with that, we actually just finished the last exercise of our workshop. Um, and basically uh, with, uh, what we learned in this workshop is that you can make use of the engine as a really generic kind of um, utility functionality that provides you with uh, different kinds of controllers that you could use for different purposes. And that's also the, according to the name of the workshop that you could really personalize anything, regardless if it's a table or if it's a grid list. And in the end, you can have also several different possibilities to use this different kind of controllers, such as interpreting it as selection state, creating filters, talking the visibility and so on. And in the end, you also have a really convenient way in how you can change the persistence layer in case you want to, for example, use the SAPI flexibility services. Okay, so with that, we're actually in the end, uh, at the end of our workshop. Uh, thanks a lot for everybody who stayed with us uh, through the implementation of the whole application. Um, I would like um, to ask um, if you have any kind of questions or if I, we should take another look at any kind of specific exercise or if you have any kind of uh, feedback, uh, which parts you like or maybe which parts are still maybe confusing or hard to understand of you, all of this would be of great value for us. So thanks a lot and we are here for your questions and feedback. Exactly, thanks a lot also again from my side. Um, and uh, regarding feedback, we're happy to hear it from you here. Um, but as well, we would be happy to get uh, the information on our GitHub. So you can just open an issue if you find something which is weird in the tutorial or anything. Please let us know. That would be very helpful for us. But um, yeah, now let's hear if you have any questions so far. Okay, I see there is some question in the room. So the question was about the general availability of the, um, of the, the whole uh, setup and uh, the engine. Um, <laughs> And um, I can say we're currently working uh, on some of the topics. 
So one you might have noticed is our bit creative approach of filtering. This is, is not yet finished. We also would like to provide a standard dialogue for filtering. And this is still in the works and we're considering minor changes to the API. So approximately, I would say with, with the next or the version after next, we want to go public with the whole feature. Uh, don't expect major changes to the, to the API and also no major changes to the tutorial, except that we might change the filtering approach in the end to the standard feature. Yeah? Um, so I would expect maybe like 1, 105. That could be the version we're going to have it. But stay tuned, check our what's new feature on the, on the OpenGR5 website. And uh, there we will bring the news as soon as it's available. Um, the question was, how are the variants saved? Local storage or with cookies? And that depends on the modification handler that is registered. The standard modification handler just does nothing. The flex modification handler in our setup stores it to the local storage. Yeah? That is why also this is, needs to be handled with care. Make, make sure that this is... Uh, um, yeah. Just just one thing to add, I think, uh, for the flex uh, modification handler in the end, in this case, in this application, it's for the local storage, but I think in, in general... In, in general uh, oh, <laughs> I wanted to come to that point. In general, there is SubUI5 flexibility services available on BTP, which you for sure can, can register for and activate. Um, we don't go into the details on that one because that's not our workshop, uh, but then they can be stored in the cloud accordingly. So uh, this is this is the prerequisites. I mean, check the link in our tutorial. There should be an introduction of uh, SAP EFI flexibility services and how you can get them. And in that case, then they will be stored and also be persistently available throughout any systems where I'm with, with your login. Just to add one thing, and this is also what uh, Christopher mentioned in the chat. There's a third modification handler available. There's the local storage modification handler. But basically, since the variant management is tightly coupled to the flexibility services, you can't really use um, the variant management in combination with the local storage modification handler. The local storage modification handler is really just a very basic way uh, and enhances the modification handler that if, for example, you want to at least have this uh, the store in the local storage, then it will just write everything into the local storage and just apply it at the next uh, time you restart the application. But these are the three different kinds of modification handlers that are available. So the modification handler for session dependent persistency, so basically no persistence, the local storage modification handler, which will just um, apply the same state exactly as you left the application and the flex modification handler, which is also the most sophisticated way, which offers the most uh, possibilities and the uh, connection with the flexibility services, which also enables your application for the variant management and the real backend persistency in the end. So the question was if if it would uh, work automatically if the app is deployed to a Fiori Launchpad, for example. So I can this uh, answer it in the following way. So it would be user specific, definitely, when you use the sub UFI flexibility services combined with the flex modification handler, then actually everything should work out of the box. Yeah. For the exact setup, um, which flexibility service would be available in your launchpad? I would have to uh, consult also our flexibility colleagues because I'm not 100% sure on that, but there should be one available. So strongly depends if you have this flexibility service available, you use the modification handler, persistency is, is ensured. Available. Yeah. I define your elements app, mm -hmm. it, will, it is available. Then, then it is available. Then it is also enough to just uh, use the flex modification handler in our case. Any extra setting in the metadata? No, no, no. The service takes care of that yeah, as it has your user and the flex modification handler and change handling underneath, which the engine does, should do the job. Yeah. Martin, maybe do you have anything to add? I think so. Yeah. Thanks again, everybody, for joining, and I hope you enjoyed. <laughs>